Did you love Divine Rifles earlier this year and have been earnestly searching for the next read that will give you similar feelings? Don't worry, I've got you covered. We've got A Study in Drowning by Ava Reed that is much different than Divine Rivals. It is much more a gothic, but they share a kind of lyricism. They share a rooting and a kind of grief and exploring a way around and out of that. And they also both feature a connection, a romance at the center that starts out as a kind of rivalry, a kind of misunderstanding of the other person person that turns into being able to see the other person the most clearly. I don't know if it's going to pick up on camera, but I did tab this book and this for me, my system is just throwing a sticky note on passages. I liked things that stuck out to me in terms of the language and the voice, the idea being explored. And there were many, many of those passages and there was almost a kind of haunting to the narrative here. I definitely regret not having yet got to my copy of The Wolf and the Woodsman that is sitting on my TBR, though I don't think you can see it. So to fully embrace the water imagery here, especially as it's raining outside, I am excited to dive into this book with you more. And we will definitely circle back to the water because there is so much symbolically going on there. But we start the book with Effie, who is a student in the architecture college in this world that is not our own and yet resembles our own in some ways. And the appearance of the architecture college, this kind of setting being our jumping off point, especially within the blurb, may lead you to believe that this book is a little bit more dark academia. And again, I do think it falls more into the realm of gothic because it's definitely exploring one of my favorite realms, that liminal space, that kind of bleeding of fantasy and reality and where that line lies and how we kind of navigate through grief and trauma. And despite the fact that Effie is in the architecture college, it is not where she really wants to be. We are introduced to her as she is looking at this flyer, for lack of a better term, that is advertising a need for an architect to rebuild, reimagine the home of her favorite author, an author that has gotten her through a lot of really hard times, an author who wrote this seminal work that has been lauded by this culture that she sees herself reflected in, in a lot of ways, and it is about the fairy king who steals a bride. And according to what we're able to gather from how it is related in the narrative is a lot about that bride kind of reclaiming her power and also how she just maneuvers in this world where she often finds herself beholden to the whims of others. And we see this experience really resonate with Effie because of how she has been beholden to the whims of others. From the beginning of the book, there's already a lot of grief and trauma that is clearly lurking in Effie's shadow. We get a sense of something that has happened with her advisor in the architecture college, which has really shaken her and is a main motivator for her desire to get off of the campus completely. And so she enters the contest to be able to come up with the blueprints to build this new home for the heir of this very famous author who has just recently passed. And so she gets this opportunity and she travels south to this very remote part of this fantasy world to a house that is on the crumbling cliffs. And in the south, we have gotten the sense of this history of a drowning the eponymous drowning and this idea of the lore of the first drowning, but also this kind of foretold second drowning and this idea that this is a very wet place. It is a very overcast place. It is very much mirroring the tenor of Effie's internal world. But when she gets there, she realizes that she is not the only university student there because there is also a literature student, Preston. And prior to her arriving, Effie already was aware of Preston because he had checked out all of the books on this very famous author that she wanted to have access to while putting together her proposal for this task, for this job. And so she gets here, he's already there, and in this world women are not allowed in the literature college because it is considered too high a form for them. There's a lot of really amped up misogyny in this culture. And so for Effie, the architecture college, despite the fact that she has no real passion for it, is about as much as she can aspire to. And so she gets here and she sees this man, I hesitate to say because it's young adult, that she already has this internal bias against, which is also underscored by some regional biases based on the fact that he is from a neighboring country, that the country at the heart of this narrative seems to have conflict with. And so it does look over the course of the narrative at breaking down some of those stereotypes, especially as Effie has really built up a lot of walls. She's turned him into her antagonist in a lot of ways, not only for what he represents, 
against what she feels he held from her, but also his coldness as she perceives it. And the fact that when she gets to this place, he has apparently been invited there by the widow of this deceased author. And she has been invited by the son, but she gets the sense that the widow doesn't necessarily want her there. She is kind of passed off to the guest house, which is separate from the main dwelling. It is a lot more ramshackle in many ways. And so there's some expected bitterness there that builds as she realizes that Preston's reason for being there may not be in line with her view of this work as she kind of stumbles upon the fact that he is aiming to show that this author was not the person who wrote his most famous work. And so she really bulks at this idea. She is almost offended by this idea because this work has been such a solace to her. She is able to recite this work at the drop of a hat. She's able to recite many of this author's works and many other authors' works at the drop of a hat, which Preston always commends her for and respects her for. And so this is another example of even though we have these two characters at odds at the beginning of this book, they always can kind of recognize and respect the aptitude of the other, which as you well know, I very much appreciate because as I've said before, I really like the rivals to lovers, enemies to lovers trope at its most basic form for the idea that it's about kind of recognizing your match in the other person. And match is also kind of apt here for a couple of reasons, because it is that match between Preston and Effie in some ways, but also Preston kind of lights a match under her. She had been very detached, very cold, out of a need for survival. And that had served her well, especially as we get the sense that all is not right in her world, both for what has happened to her in the past, but also in her ability to kind of assess reality. There is not an explicitly stated mental illness, but she also has medication to kind of help with things that she may be seeing that aren't necessarily there that is referenced throughout the narrative. However, part of this world is that kind of breakdown of reality versus fantasy and is everything that Effie has believed is in her head really in her head or is it this breakdown of that liminal space between the real world and the fantasy world, which is the entity that Effie thinks she is seeing. So we have a narrator, while it's not first person, it is told through Effie's perspective that we can't necessarily trust her point of view all the time. And she doesn't trust her own point of view, but that kind of breakdown of reality is at the center of so much of this and is definitely in line with the exploration of the Fey realms in a much broader sense. And so we've got this very detached kind of approach to everything. And I've talked before about narratives that make me feel like they're putting me at a distance or that feel foggy and fuzzy in some way and that keep me as a reader somewhat at arm's length. And here I thought it was maneuvered so so well because it illustrated and kind of communicated that kind of foggy sense that Effie may be kind of operating under but it never felt less immediate to me as a reader. It didn't feel like it was pushing me away as a reader. Rather it felt like it was kind of using that to invite me in in some ways, especially as you're trying to kind of gauge what is real or isn't real within this world, especially a world that is so primed for you to believe the fantasy within the setting. And the setting, again, this idea of drowning is definitely a part of it. And I think it goes so much deeper than I initially kind of assessed because when I first started reading the book, I was like, oh, okay, I get it. It's drowning because it's also reflecting Effie's mental state. She feels like she is being pulled under. She is drowning in some way. And in many ways, it's about her kind of fighting to the surface. And we see that very real imagery of rebirth. Additionally, I love the setting for the superstition it establishes because then we have this kind of what's real, what's not real within Effie and her more direct experience, what's in her head. But then this is kind of expanded and exacerbated by the setting itself because this community, this space really does buy in to the superstition, the mythological, what may be lurking in the corner of Effie's sight. And this kind of exploration of belief versus objective truth is also at the heart of this and is also part of the central conflict initially between Effie and Preston because Preston is very much interested in finding the truth, finding the objective truth. And he's like, I'll believe whatever the truth is, I just want to find it. And Effie really pushes back against this idea of objective truth within the kind of contextualization, especially of literature, because Preston wants to be able to argue a firm point around a work where a lot is open to interpretation. One thing I especially appreciated was one of the main passages from this fictional work that is quoted a lot in 
in the book is really open to interpretation, even for us as readers. And sure, there were absolutely times I would have loved for us to dive further into this work to get to know it a little bit more intimately, especially as it is so important to Effie. But I do think it struck a really nice balance in keeping us a little distant from it as well so that we didn't become so wrapped up in that that we lost sight of everything else, especially because so much of the narrative is focused on how we interact with stories. There's a great quote here that says, as if stories were not spoils of war. It really looks at how the stories we tell perpetuate certain things, and that's very much part of the climax of the book and the resolution in a way that I'm absolutely not going to spoil for you. And while some of the more revelatory moments of that climax and conclusion weren't necessarily shocking to me, I think this is one of those instances where when I talk about things don't necessarily need to be a surprise to land because it's landed so well. And so also circling back to this idea of stories and also this idea of objective versus more malleable truth, we're seeing as Effie and Preston get closer that ideas are challenged for the both of them and they both kind of struggle against it in different ways but are both really capable of learning and growing and taking this information and respecting the other through it once they get past some of their initial differences and agree to a compromise and as they start to move into much more tender feelings toward one another and how Preston is kind of adjusting his view of reality too and how Effie is opening herself up and making herself vulnerable to him in many ways ways that are incredibly powerful in light of the ways she has been made vulnerable outside of her own choices by others and the way that Preston recognizes that. And yet in terms of this idea of the kind of mythical world, the fairy king in particular, he really struggles with being able to buy into that idea. And so we're left kind of looking at the root of the story. One of the things I think this book is really interested in interrogating and one of the lines that stuck out the most to me upon reading and I think was meant to because it's reiterated later is a line from Preston that says, I can't tell you I believe in the fairy king Effie, but I believe in your grief and your fear. Isn't that enough? And so in many ways, it's about how stories have the power to communicate these difficult feelings like grief and sorrow and how they also offer strength through those emotions, things I think most of us are familiar with on some level in terms of finding solace between pages. And it also poses important questions, offers opportunity for discussion. Does literature have objective truth? I would argue no, but that is a much more philosophical argument than I think I'm prepared to have in this moment. But I think it's one of the arguments and conversations this book is actively engaged in through this story. And in a way that it's illustrated in this way, I think is a point in my favor. And also the fact that it's illustrating this, particularly I go back to this idea of grief because it is so central to this book. Effie very much has some significant trauma that she is working through that is weighing her down and that she is fighting through actively. And I think Reed does an incredible job at illustrating how flashes of these things can slip in through something as simple as a glance at a green chair. And I think the tone and the voice of this, like I said, really establish this state of mind, this feeling, without keeping us as readers at a distance or also dragging us too far down into that grief where it feels like we can't necessarily breathe. Also a slight tangent that's not really related to the tone of the piece or the thematic overview is where we've been kind of centering ourselves here. But Preston, his main goal at the outset of this book is to basically prove that this author did not write this book. And I, for the life of me in the way this was framed, could not help but think of Oxfordians. And potentially because I do not like Oxfordian theories, this definitely impacted my view of Preston and Preston's view at the beginning of this book. And in some ways, I think it was meant to. But this whole kind of exploration of whether this author wrote this book or not, as they are searching for this ephemeral objective truth, forces Effie to come face to face with some other truths about this author outside of the kind of question of authorship that changes the tenor of her reaction to this work. This work that has been so central in her ability to ground herself. So in many ways, this is also about being able to face disappointment with a creator that you have put on a pedestal in some ways, whose work has been a guiding light in your life, which feels incredibly pertinent. And again, isn't really telling us how to feel, but showing us how Effie is feeling and how Effie is navigating all of this. And so I think that the emotion that is so central to this, even when Effie is trying to kind of cut herself off from emotion, because she feels that is where she kind of bleeds into the unknown, that is the heart of this. And again, so many subtle moments are 
are illustrated so well through very simple actions. So at the end of the day, this book is atmospheric, it's romantic, and it's got beautiful symbolism and metaphor about moving through grief moving through tragedy, and also finding solace in the written word. So if you've read this, I would love to hear your thoughts. Does literature have an objective truth? There is truly so much to discuss here, and as usual, we have barely scratched the surface, so please feel free to leave your thoughts below. But as always, thank you so much for hanging out and listening to mine. Like and subscribe if you feel like it. Most importantly, as always, read something good, and yeah, bye.